TEDx Johannesburg 2016, Molweni. That hushed Molweni gives me a sense. I should have said Amandla, but I'm afraid of the response that I would have gotten. Africans have a way with words. A very interesting and very marvelous grasp of language and words. The renowned Nigerian scholar Chinua Achebe, in conversation with James Baldwin, said, we are not only receivers of art, we are also makers of art. And similarly, I would apply the same logic to technology and some of the tools of the 21st century that lead us to speak about the abundance we often want to speak of. So, to paraphrase him, we are not only receivers of technology, but we are also makers of technology. And in a very sort of godlike fashion, we would want to fashion technology, not only in our image, but in a way that responds to our own needs. So, I'll, before I go into what I mean by that, allow me to say a bit more about myself. My name is Awonke Ayabonga Mapulanyile Tawe. Unfortunately, the two names, which are unknown to most people, didn't make it into the green barcoded ID that proves that I'm here and that I exist and that I'm not an alien. However, I think my beginning starts much further than that. My parents had a lot to do with it. My father is a sort of a teacher trade union lefty communist type who married my mother a year after I was born. And my mother an enterprising, assertive, industrious, closer woman. You know, the kind of woman, and if you don't know what that means, you know, that's the Methodist uh, Thursday Women's Union. The real Women's League, if I should add. But I guess my beginnings start much, much further than that. My genesis starts, I would say, in the 15th century in what is now called the Eastern Cape, among my own people. Those indeed are my people. And so when I introduce myself, it would be incomplete if I don't summon their names and summon their memory. As Tati said, I'm an economist by training, and economists aren't sort of the most creative storytellers, nor, nor the most creative people, I would add. However, I studied economics because I guess it helped me to understand how public policy and collective decisions had an influence on three things which I think have really framed my own curiosity and my own inquiries over my life. The first is how we understand authority. The second is how we understand identity and race. And the last one, which I think is very important, is how we understand power. So for me, it's quite unsettling to really speak to a crowd of people who paid 1,500 rand to come and hear me speak. When I understand that the median wage, for instance, of domestic workers in this country is 1,577. Let me give you a second and let that sink in. 77 rand more than you've paid to be here for the next two days is what 50% of people pay and less for the woman, the black woman, who clean their living spaces and who raise their children. And that for me is the invisible work of social reproduction. It's the work that prepares us for our different labors. We get the kids ready for school, iron the nice shirts and the starch collar to get us ready for the boardroom, and all of the other labors, and yet that labor is seen as invisible. My own grandmother was a domestic worker in Orange Grove here in Johannesburg for about three decades until she retired in the early 2000s with a brown bag with 10,000 rand in it and a few hand-me-downs, which I think by now we've outgrown. But you see, that, that was her retirement, her thank you for her loyalty and commitment for three decades. And so you then understand why I feel it's a bit unsettling as someone born in a small town sandwich between Transkai and the Siskai, and I guess it might explain the other names that don't make it into my ID. But I want to speak about exploitation in this age of digital expansion and boundless information and how it is experienced by the people who in this country have always been and have shouldered the cost of our expansions, of our skyways, byways, and other physical markers of progress. 
in many ways, I think we need to answer how technology and its advances intersect in a society like ours, in a post-colonial, post-apartheid society, with many of its hang-ups and hangovers from the past. What does it mean to speak about abundance if we never speak about those excluded from that abundance? What does it mean to think about you know, the advances that, as the organizers say, have the possibility of really, for the first time, I think, in centuries, totally eradicating poverty. And so I think, as I think about this intersection between authority, identity, race, and power, I spoke to meter taxi drivers in the west of Johannesburg a few months ago. During the wake of their violent uh, interactions with the Uber taxi drivers, and I spoke to them because I felt that their narrative never really made it into sort of our public discourse or even in the media. Painted as they were, savage Luddites, violent, prone people, who didn't really have an interest in coming along with us into the 21st century. And this is what some of them had to say. Let's take a look at this. But they came in South Africa to capture us, our injustice. They hijacked our injustice, and that's what we don't want. Like. Um, yeah. When they came here, they should have uh, came to us and then negotiate with us. Within us, meta taxis and Uber. It was nice to solve our go here. Fanaguti, don't get Uber, the meta taxi. If one of us is allowed to go to the seven, the night. Seven is on the same system. If our price is 50 rand, then it will be 50 rand. If the price would be maybe like a kilometer, is 12 rand 50, it will be 12 rand 50. What is the difference? What is the 50-50? Technology is 100%. We want it. But now the government should come in and assist our people. Because they're charging very less, less, less. less. Yeah, yeah, and they, maybe you can find the difference of uh, under rand in our prices. So it's not good. Whenever you go to apply the permit there, you need to have your starting point. Uber doesn't have a starting point. Our people can't get uh, permits there at the port because they don't have a starting point. But why Uber is getting uh, permits whereas they don't have that starting starting point? So they're just using our people for Mahala. You know what I mean? Mm. And about Tindezena, so it's our raid, we're in ourselves. As you remember, go Santin, you go about Babina Ramakatara, it was each and every section near the metatics around Johannesburg. Mm. That's why we want to fight tomorrow. Little tag tag tag, I already understand. Little tag 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 more. Those are the really feel that we, we are worried of. We are not we are not the type of people that we fight. We don't like fight. Since from the start in that into the MM takes here there's no war. But when if we bonabas we baba call baba fungus in this that's where they they will they will see our faces. There's three things that really emerged from the story of the meter taxi drivers. The notable one for me was around labor issues. Alongside those issues was the challenge of anti-competitive price behavior. So they were complaining that Uber, in the main, was unable to really set them up in a way that they could compete with the Uber drivers because many of them were charging about 100 rand less. And also, I think there was the real challenge around whether or not the partner drivers were actually employees. And if you look at the shouldering of the risk in that partnership, or whatever relationship you would like to call it, it was the drivers who, in the end, had to really shoulder an inordinate amount of risk. They had to pay for the installment of the car, they had to pay for insurance, they had to pay for maintenance. And yet, at the end of it, the, the barons of Silicon Valley would just take their 20%. And in many ways, they were reminded that they are indeed workers, and not necessarily partners. They are, just like many other workers, handlers of machines, Drillers of rock, manching alana wear conveyor belt, merchants in life, restoration and death, bush mechanics, peddling vendors, drunken pastors. Uskelem Tsuwumfundis is also a worker. As much as those who hold the wealth of the world in their hands for a second before its allure and the hierarchies of the world evade their grasp and the hungry grumbles of their empty stomachs. We are reminded, ladies and gentlemen, that we are also the children of workers. We are the children of workers who looked after the children of others, but never their own. We are workers ourselves, albeit well-trained ones. Sophisticated hobos, two paychecks from the bread lines. A lion is a lion in the wild or in the zoo, it matters not. 
if you clean corridors or turn tricks, sell stocks or paint apartment blocks. Blue or white, the color is the same when you tie it up. Brown or green, the, ga the cash is the same when we count it up. Physical or mental, the control is the same. When you pair it up, we are reminded that all of us are workers. And even in this age of technological innovation, we are once again reminded that the unequal power relationships are never replaced nor displaced by technology. In many instances, technology, the new technologies are able to do what previous technologies were unable to do, which is to exploit our people much further and much more efficiently. But more importantly, I think there is a positive side to technology as well. We've seen, for instance, in a continent like ours that's always been defined by migration, that technology is able to give life to people. It's been able to allow, through Mukuru, EcoCash, and Pesa, to allow us to send money across borders. It's also allowed us to be able to build early warning systems for crises, political violence, and a range of other emergencies. In addition to this, we've also been able to transact in transactions across the globe beyond the borders that were set in 1885 without our permission and without our consent. And so I think for me, there's something I want to leave in the room today, which is if we are indeed to not only be receivers but makers of technology, how do we make it in a way that resolves and responds to some of our social challenges? More importantly, how do we speak about monopolization of our economy? An economy where four millers feed us all, where four banks bank us all, where three telecoms companies connect us all. And unfortunately, if we are unable to have this conversation, then we defend and we reproduce the status quo, which is one of concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, while our regulators find themselves standing afar, indifferent, and exploitation continues to the dance of a QWERTY tune while we can request, and at the response of a please rate me, sir, we'll then click on the four stars and carry on with our lives. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the responsibility if we are to indeed be makers and not only receivers of technology. And I remind us once again that we are workers, albeit well-trained ones, sophisticated hobos, two paychecks away from the bread lines. A lion is a lion in the zoo or in the wild. It matters not if you clean corridors or turn tricks, sell stocks or paint apartment blocks. It matters not if the collar is blue or white, or the cash is brown or green. Because physical or mental, the control is the same when you pair it up. We are indeed workers, and we are and the children of workers who raise the children of others, but never their own. Thank you. <laughs>